This video investigates the calculation for determining the proper radius of a Schwarzschild black hole. It makes use of geodesics to probe the region within the Schwarzschild radius to determine a maximum value for this quantity. Now subscribe to this channel has asked the following question and that's what's prompted this video. So they want to know what the um, what is the proper distance for the um, radius of a Schwarzschild black hole? Not the coordinate distance, which is well known, 2gm on c squared, but what is the proper distance? Okay, now, in a previous video, the proper distance between two events in the region outside the Schwarzschild radius of some mass can be found using the line element, and we'll just have a quick look at that in the next slide. Uh, so the coordinate distance dr is not the physical distance between two events, it's simply a result of the difference between coordinates. Coordinates are not physical measurements, they're just a coordinate system. They don't represent physical measurements. So the coordinate distance dr is just that a coordinate distance. It's not a physical distance. It's not the same as laying down a measuring rod and instantaneously determining the distance between two points. Now the relationship between the coordinate interval dr and the proper distance ds is this object here. And this comes from the line element. Um, and this term here is the um, g subsequent r, r term of the um, Schwarzschild metric. Now the proper distance is a physical distance between two coordinate points as measured by measuring rods placed between the two points. So the measurement occurs at the same, at the same location. Um, you measure out your rod, you know the length of your rod, and your rods are fixed between the two locations. And so you have the proper distance. All right, now, so the um, subscriber's question was, what is the proper distance of the radius of a Schwarzschild mass? Okay, so we're looking at the Schwarzschild uh, mass here, Schwarzschild black hole, and we want to know what is the proper distance here from the event horizon, any point on the event horizon, and in the radial direction down to the singularity at r equals zero. So this region here is what we want to look at. Okay, so how, how can we do that? Well, we know that the space-time around a Schwarzschild mass can be divided up into all these geodesics and a free particle will follow uh, a geodesic. If it's not subject to any forces, then it is a free particle and it will just follow along a geodesic. So we can imagine a, a free particle falling uh, on, in a radial direction, so a radial geodesic, um, and encountering the event horizon here, and then continuing on into the singularity. And we want to know what is the proper distance here. Now, for a particle of mass, then we've got to consider a time-like uh, trajectory, all right? And we're going to use uh, the fall velocity of a particle with mass. And one thing we know about geodesics is that a particle following a geodesic, well one thing about geodesic is that they tra parallel transport their own tangent vectors. So the fall velocity is tangent to the geodesics, tangent to the world line, which is the geodesics that the particle is following. So a free particle, not subject to any forces, will fall in from a distance, strike the event horizon, and keep going on into the singularity at r equals zero. All right, and it will follow a geodesic. In the space time outside this Warsaw mass, it follows geodesics, and when it encounters the event horizon, that's not a physical surface stopping it, that's simply an artifact of the coordinates that we're using. And it carries on through the event horizon, still, as we might expect, on a geodesic. And it will follow a geodesic all the way down to the singularity r equals zero. So it's that geodesic, and it's this method using the geodesic that's going to give us a sense of what this proper distance from this point on the event horizon, or any point on the event horizon, you know, along a radial path into the singularity. So just because it crosses an event horizon doesn't mean it stops it should it stops following a geodesic. It will continue to follow a geodesic. So and that geodesic parallel transports its own tangent vector. And the tangent vector is the fall velocity of the particle. Okay. All right. Um, now Interesting, the, the ingoing geodesics in Eddington Finkelstein coordinates suggest that the local speed of light is constant. So these are ingoing geodesics here, and we can see the speed of light 
is constant on these. So uh, a, a photon falling in uh, will still move at the speed of light. We expect that the even having crossed the event horizon, the vertical red line here, the speed of light continues according to these coordinates to be um, constant, the, having the value of C. So we can expect that we can follow the geodesic across the event horizon and into the singularity. And so it, it will continue to tra parallel transport its four velocity, uh, which is the tangent vector to the um, geodesic. And one thing about parallel transport, what it tries to do is it tries to keep the magnitude of the vector and its direction constant as it moves in infinitely small incremental steps. So infinitesimally small steps, the four vector, four vector is moved parallel to itself and its magnitude is held constant. So okay, so one thing we can use for a mass which follows a time-like path is its four velocity is this object here. This is the magnitude square of the four velocity. The four velocity is tangent to the geodesic. Um, it can be represented in this form here using the metric and the two contravariant components. And it's equal to this constant here, minus c squared, using the particular metric signature I'm using here and on this channel. So it's minus c squared. This is a constant value, and that agrees with the fact that geodesics parallel transport their own tangent vector. And the tangent vector in this case is the four velocity of the particle. So parallel transport means that the uh, magnitude of the vector is held constant and the direction is held constant as it's moved in incrementally infinitesimally small steps along the geodesic. So let's work with the constancy of the magnitude of the forward velocity and that will help us. Okay so here it is expanding this out we have all of this okay so expanding that out using the Schwarzschild metric gives us this object here all right and uh, replacing u0 with dt detail, u1 with dr detail, u2 with d theta detail, and the final angular part, the azimuthal angle, d phi detail. Okay. Next step. Okay, so there's, there is the four velocity expanded out and equal to this, and the magnitude of it is minus c squared, the magnitude squared. The actual magnitude is the square root of this, so if we want to find the magnitude of this, we'd have to take the square root of this, but so we're using the magnitude squared. Same thing, it's still a magnitude. All right, well, what we're going to do is multiply through by minus one. Okay, so when we multiply through by minus one, this becomes positive, this becomes negative, negative, negative. All right, and then one other thing we're going to do now is we're just going to rearrange these terms. So we're going to do a little bit of algebra, bring this to the front, take the negative sign out. And so this term here with the negative in front is just the same as this one here. Same here, take the this second term to the f first term, factor out the negative sign there. Okay, this goes from negative to positive. So all we've done is multiply through by negative one. That's this first line here, first section here. And then we rearrange the two leading terms this part here, a little bit of algebra, and so we end up, this first term is negative, second term is positive, third term negative, fourth term negative, and notice only the, the only positive term is this second one here. We're going to use that in the next step. So what we're doing is following a geodesic from the event horizon down to the singularity, given that a geodesic parallel transports its own tangent vector, and does that, does that by holding the magnitude constant, and the direction constant. Okay, so here we are just rewriting our four velocity squared, the magnitude here. Okay, notice this become plus c squared on the end here because we multiplied through by minus one on the previous page. Now if you have a look here, this uh, first term is negative, third term is negative, fourth term is negative. The only positive term in here is this second term, which contains dr d tau. And a particle on a radial path will need this particular term. Um, Okay, even if the third and fourth disappear. If we hold the angle constant, these would disappear. Okay, so what that implies is that given that this is negative and this is negative and this is negative, but it's all got to sum up to this positive quantity here, then clearly this value here must be greater than c squared. Because when you finish subtracting these terms, 
um, you've got to end up with plus c squared. So clearly this second positive term here is greater than c squared in order for all this to sum to c squared. A little bit of algebra now. Take the square root of both sides. Here we go. Um, <clears throat> next thing now is I'm just going to multiply through by d tau, which is a positive quantity here, so it doesn't reverse the direction of the inequality sign, keeps it the same. Okay, so what this is telling us is that the particle reached the singularity within a distance, or, time, or even time, as we'll see at the end, of c times tau is less than c tau max. There's some maximum upper value we're going to be able to work out, and the actual value will be something less than this, up to this, but less than. Okay, um, notice c is meters per second, tau is seconds, so you have a distance here. This is a distance. c times tau is a distance. All right, rearranging. I'm just going to do a little bit of algebra here and just rearrange it into a form that's useful because I'm going to use some integral tables later on. So we've got this here, um, and I'm just going to put it over a common denominator, so we end up with this. Uh, uh, take the reciprocal. We have this object here, which will be handy shortly. And we're going to integrate in the direction of decreasing r. So we're going to go from the event horizon down to the singularity. And so our ct, c tau, proper time tau, max, will be negative of all this. All right. Integral from the event horizon to zero. We take the negative because we're going in the decreasing direction. So this will give us a negative result. So we need the negative to cancel that out because we can't have a negative distance. So using an integral table, I found this on the internet. I mean, I also did it with a software package, which is much quicker and gives me the end result. But anyway, let, let me just write in sake. I'll use the uh, integral here. Uh, use the integral table for this value here. We'll do a substitution. In our case, we'll take p is 0, q is 2gm, x is c squared r, dx is c squared dr. Our integral becomes, this thing here becomes this, known as p is 0, so it drops off here, q minus x, q minus x, c squared dr. Now notice, uh, we wanted this quantity here. We want to integrate this quantity, if you remember. And so we need this factor of 1 on c squared here to get rid of this c squared. So this thing here is what we're after, is the integral of this object. And for this part in here, we can use the integral table. Next bit, so c tau max minus the integral of this object here, which is minus 1 on c squared, all of this. From the integral table, we substitute in, if you remember, x was c squared r, q was 2gm, and uh, in we go here, this bit here. Now we're going to evaluate between our terminals here, terminal values, 2gm c squared over c squared, sorry, to zero. So, oh, by the way, two here, negative here, cancel that with the negatives in here, one, two there. So this is all positive now. And then when we substitute in, we're going to substitute in the zero first. Well, r is zero. That all, this first term disappears. Uh, second term, we end up with 2g sine, and here, 2gm on uh, zero, that disappears, so 2gm on 2gm is just 1, square root of 1 is 1, so we have 2gm inverse sine of 1. Minus now, this part here, if we substitute in, the uh, substitute in here, r, the c squares cancel left for 2gm, uh, 2gm here, now 2gm minus 2gm, that's what this becomes, 2gm is 0, so that bit drops off. And then putting the value in here, c squared gets rid of this c squared, so we have 2gm minus 2gm, again 0 of something, so inverse sine of 0, which gives us 0. We come down here, inverse sine of 1 is pi on 2. Uh, the 2s will cancel, and we're going to be left with 1 on c squared times pi times gm. So there's our proper distance from the singularity to the event horizon. It's less than that value. So it's up to, close to, but less than that value. That's our maximum value we would expect. So our particle travels a distance of up to pi gm on c squared. Now, okay, so that's our distance. Let's just have a look here. Notice that the distance c tau, pi gm on c squared, that implies that tau is pi gm on c cubed. Uh, if you remember, um, ds would be c d tau, uh, so s would be c tau. Um, and that's how this comes about here. So this is a distance. And our proper time tau then becomes pi gm on c cubed, which means our particle covers this distance in a time of no more than the finite time of pi gm on c cubed. So our particle of mass falling from the event horizon of the Schwarzschild black hole reaches the singularity 
in uh, a finite time of no more than pi gm on c cubed. Now, our approach here seems reasonable, just reminding because the ingoing Eddington Finkelstein coordinates imply that the local speed of light is the constant value of c, uh, including into and beyond the event horizon down towards the singularity. That's just the local speed uh, for an observer traveling, having crossed the event horizon. Now, just a caution here. Um, at r equals zero, the curvature becomes infinite and Einstein's equation becomes invalid in this region. So that sounds a note of caution when using this approach. Um, we, do, we do need to be careful there. It, they do break down. But reasonable confidence, given that GDs is continued down, must continue down past the event horizon, down into the singularity. This is reasonable confidence that that's the proper distance here for the um, Schwarzschild radius, the proper distance as opposed to the coordinate distance, and this is the proper time a particle of mass will take falling in. All right, that's it.